a very, very rich panel that I'll tell you about shortly. But I want to hear from a board member of the partners for this event, Mr. Alex Asiedu, who is the board chair of Impact Investing Ghana. Alex, thank you for joining this program. Please let's hear your welcome address. Thank you, Bernard. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And you're warmly welcome to CTFM and Impact Investing Ghana's Financing for Development Dialogue. On Saturday, I took a trip to one of the larger towns in the eastern region. It had just rained and the green terrain and there was this vibrant vibe about the place. It gave quite an allure. But the number of young people and the poor infrastructure set me thinking. How would all these young people be absorbed into the labor force and get into productive ventures in the next couple of years? And the next question for me was, what would happen if the labor force could not absorb them? You may extend these questions across the length and breadth of a country. Setting up a development bank in a country like ours should in theory answer these questions. And there's evidence across other countries, especially the developed world, Japan, Korea, Germany, etc., that suggests that development banks can partially correct private market failures and provide outside solutions to development problems. But let me just stop here. Let me ask you and let me ask myself, do we have that evidence in Ghana? <laughs> the evidence here is decidedly mixed. It's not just factors like poor credit quality or inadequate strategic focus that have made development banks a failure or near failure in our country. It is what I would call the elephant in the room. Political and economic rent seekers who hijack institutions like these for their own selfish interests, thus depriving the state of much needed capital for broad-based growth. And I hope that in the next one and a half hours, we will understand the formula and workings that will improve the chances that the Development Bank Ghana will indeed serve its stated purpose and add to the success stories of development banks across the globe. It has to be successful because as a country, we're running out of time. Welcome once again to you all. Thank you very much, Alex. And we hope to um, hear more about what Impact Investing Ghana will be doing going forward. It's a very important component of our development effort. And I'm, I'm sure Amma will tell us later on what IIG is about and why your work is very important for Ghana. I want to now introduce our panel members. Dr. Ritmondi Tuahene is our first speaker, and he is a banking and corporate governance consultant. Now, for those of you who don't know, he's quite a prolific writer, and I personally enjoy the clarity he brings to economic and finance issues. He regularly writes for the Business and Financial Times. I think he's done 10 articles on this, if I'm not mistaken. Doc, is it 10 or 9 in the BNFT series? Really, really good indeed. He's going to start off, start us off. And I just want to be sure he's hearing me. So, Doc, good morning. Thank you for joining us on this IIGCT TV platform. Good morning, Bernard. Great. Morning, Bernard, thank you. I can, I can hear you. Thank you for joining us. What do you have for us this morning? Well, I have an easy text of talking about the development bank framework and the standards and the structures that have to be set up to enable us to contribute to the transformation agenda of the economy. And I believe if we follow it, do we follow the process diligently? And as the first speaker said, devoid of political interferences and do it very well. In less than no time, we will be able to reduce poverty alleviation, create employment, and at the same time, the economy will grow. And more importantly, if we stay focused on the mandate, we'll be able to save the nation millions of dollars used for, say, rice and maize. All these things will go a long way to help the country. And Bernard, let me comment the idea, the, gov the government for even thinking about development banking is something that I've said it over and over again, that this nation will not develop. It will not develop if we continue to look at the universal banks or the commercial banks. Because there is the short term end of the market, but we are looking for medium term to long term focus agenda 
where we'll be able to invest in the very sectors that will contribute to the economy. So I think it's an opportunity for, for the city, FM and Investment Ghana to bring such a very, very relevant, very relevant topic in the times of the Ghanaian history. So I want to thank you for Bernard for welcoming here. And I thank all the panel and other people who will be following us for this morning issue. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you. I think you can go straight ahead into what you have for us. We are ready to hear you. Good. As, as the Mr. Siru said earlier, we have earlier in the 60s and 63, 63 had this development banking set by the former president, Dr. Kwame Nkoma. All the idea was that we should place emphasis on the agri sector and the industry. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we messed it up and had the mandate withdrawn. So the 2018 budget, when I heard the Honorable Finance Minister spoke about setting up, establishing a development bank, I said, look, this is a wonderful idea, very, very wonderful, because I think to save this country and the economy, and for the future generation, future generation, we need to develop the economy. So when he brought the, um, the idea, I thought it was a wonderful thing. But let me first start with the, what development banking is all about. Development banking is, about, is all about intervention by government to reduce the market failures in the systems and to provide finance for the strategic sectors of the economy. Strategic sectors of the economy in the sense that in, Africa, in Ghana, for instance, strategic sectors are the agri. But unfortunately, if you look at the Bank of Ghana report much, the whole agri, including fishing and forestry, contribution was only 5%. How would we contribute? How do we develop the economy like that? So I believe that the form of intervention and the, gov the government is setting up, if we all take it wholeheartedly and take it proactively, we'll be able to build a very, very good economy and transform the economy for not for ourselves, people like us who are old, but the future generation. We possibly even prevent migration, the migration crossing the sea, be because there was so much jobs and job creation and employment in this economy that people would then begin, begin to leave from Europe to come and enjoy the economy. So development banking is about the long-term, long-term, medium-term to long-term financing. But what's, the development banking has two fields. We have the retail development banks. The retail will lend direct to the customers. But what the Minister of Finance is then trying to do is the second tier, the wholesale lending, lending through the PSI, the Participation Financial Institution, to customers. That is what the model that they have adopted. I don't know why they did that, but from the literature that I have read from both the World Bank report survey on 2017, and especially the World Bank report on Ghana 2016 about development finance institution, uh, there is a, a dichotomy between using the on-lending on -lending facilities with the, the second tier, which the, the, the minister has adopted. It's a very good idea, but it beholds on us that we need to have the soft structures very well. And the government should not rush. Let me repeat, we are not in competition with any country. We are not in competition with anybody. It is an institution set to help us for today, tomorrow, and the future. Let us take our time and put the soft structures. Because what happens with, if you read the World Bank report, 2017 survey of all national development banks in the world, there are certain substructures that needs to be put to be able to transform the economy. And I hope and pray that during the implementation, these substructures will be clearly defined, clearly defined, because if we fail to implement the substructures very well, we'll have another failure in, as part of the failures of the development finance institution we have. And the World Bank report talk about 
corporate governance. Somebody will tell me this, Dr. Twain, he likes talking about corporate governance. But let me make it clear. Observation has come that businesses that have too much government position in it does not survive. So if we're going to set corporate governance, which is the best practice, which is for the survival and the success of the business, we must talk about good corporate governance. What I mean is that how are these businesses going to be run by independent directors and managers who will be accountable to the, 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 the government and other stakeholders? Very, very important. Other than that, it will be one of the stories of what happened to the earlier corporate, uh, the earlier development finances institutions we have. And the World Bank has critically said that, and he, I quote the World Bank, you need to put a very good corporate governance, including independent directors. When I say independent directors, I'm not saying that government should not have people on the board, but we have a cream de la cream board member, business people, who really understand the business. Other than that, it will be one of the things that has happened to us. So the World Bank report states that if you want to have a good corporate, if you want to have a good and a successful uh, development finance or development banking institution, first think about your corporate governance first. The second one that is so critical for the survival of the uh, development bank in Ghana is that you need to have a definitive mandate Definitive mandate. You see, you don't create a broad mandate. I look at what we have. We're supposed to support agribusiness, manufacturing, tourism, business operations, IT, ICT, tourism, what have we, what have we. The mandate is so huge that if you want to implement it, you'll be spreading your credit thinly on the system, and at the end of it all, it will make any impact. So for the first three years, those who are going to implement it, I would urge them, I beseech them, that they should narrow the mandate to start the business operation, to see that it is going on very well, because before they add it on. Because the World Bank has said that you need to have a definitive mandate, or what we call strategic focus, if it's rice, I'm going to use rice as an example. If we want to go into rice, we are importing close to 2 billion of rice every year. And we can develop and grow rice and possibly export and be able to save the country. If not the first year, the, the second year, we'll be able to save the country nearly a billion or 2 billion. And that will help the foreign exchange. That is what I'm saying that we should do our analysis very well, and see the strategic areas. Other than that, we will spread thinly and will not make impact. And if we don't make impact, then it will be one of the, one of the things that happened to the earlier deployment banks, deployment finance institutions in Ghana. So let them start. If we're going to talk about, as the World Bank has said, let us have a definitive mandate, strategic core areas. Let's see, we're doing that at Greek, and in Agri, even in Agri, we're talking about rice, we're talking about cashew, we're talking about maize, which I'm told recently we have to import maize from Malaysia, from uh, Malawi. I mean, it is a country where we can produce so much, we don't want to put resources in. And when you look at the Bank of Ghana report, or the, the bank's report, the whole total agriculture, including the fishing and uh, forestry, was 5%. Is, there way, is that the way we want to go? If we do it right and follow the substructures critically, this country will get to position. As we talk about the mandate, I have, and I want to critique the mandate we have now. Looking at the resources we have, I've heard we have $250 million from the IDA, we have uh, 170 from U EIB Euro, and then uh, KFW have $46 million. If we are going to online these facilities, let us no need for us to rush. Let us look at the strategic areas and begin to invest, which would impact even on the repayment. Because in projects, 
In project finance, what you're looking at is that you're looking at the intended cash flow and the asset that will come out of it. But in our case, we are looking at the, the cash flow, the, the reduction of unemployment, poverty, so that the growth of the economy, so that this economy will see a, 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 a life, lifetime in some years to come. Then I move to financial survivability. So survivability. Most development banks have failed because there were no comprehensive financial survivability plan. What I mean is that it is not every day you go and borrow. You must put a structure down that will enable you to, although they are long-term loans, you have grace period, you have a moratorium, but you will always make sure that the project you're going in are projects that can generate enough cash flow that will be able to repay in the long term the loans that you're taking and make sure that you have enough to run the business for today and for the future. You're not going to borrow all the time. So financial survivability, according to the World Bank, is also a key substructure for uh, a, a very successful development bank. Financial sustainability, as I said, if you wouldn't mind, Bernard, let me quote Diamond. He said, it defines us Financial survivability of development finance as a capacity to attract on the basis of his own performance funds they require to pay creditors and at the same time sustain the shareholders' interest and support the economic agenda of the country. So if we're going to appoint board, the board should collaborate seriously with Minister of Finance to develop a financial survivability plan that would enable this business to be on till, till Jesus come. Other than that, a time will come, the funds will dry up, and all the projects will come to standstill, and they may not be able to generate the necessary cash flow. So it's very, very important, Bernard, that uh, those who will be in charge must be tasked whether the board, in conjunction with the Minister of Finance, to see the way forward. Because if you look at, let me use one of the, uh, the demand finance institutions, like Exxon. They always have 0.5% from tax, uh, I think, on duties. That means that there will always be some inflow. But this development finance is not going to get anything. It is left to those of us in charge. As I said, that is why I talk about good corporate governance. The board appointed businessmen competent people, qualified people, who will be able to use their knowledge to leverage a way of getting cheaper funds to support the business we're talking about. Now, the World Bank also talks about higher and higher disclosure and transparency. You see, higher disclosure and transparency is about how fluid is the project? Who is keeping track of the project from day one to day two? Who is monitoring what? What reports are they generating? Especially when we are doing the on-lending finance. I'm not sure the banks will be so equipped to be able to do the monitoring and report back to the, the, the development bank institution. And it should be so critical that we must do it. Other than that, if you lend the money, give the money to them, and they go and do something else. By the time you realize, they have thrown the money away. Oh, you have, you have a couple of minutes. You have two minutes. OK. No, go ahead. Now, thank you, Bernard. One thing I want to make it critical, clear, and it is empirical, and it's a must business. Because we are doing wholesale to the participating financial institutions, let the people who are in charge think about technical assistance and capacity building. When I say that, I mean currently the industry, which I have worked for years, I don't think we have specialists to understand the areas where we want to go. Like Agri, this morning I heard somebody to Agri Finance. Look, recently I took a trip to one of the big projects in Pineapple. I spent three days over there. 
how the land is being tilled, how the outgoers are being developed, how the, the sockets are being planted. I spent three days over there. And when I came back, I asked myself, if I was sitting in my former bank, would I even understand the process? It, the skills are not there. I'm sure Mrs. Nora Banaman is there. I know her very well. I know her very well. He will say, he will tell you. I know her very well. Because in her industry, I used to visit her when I was in one of the banks. The question is that we sit in the bank, but we have no idea of project management and project financing. That is not our core business because we are universal banks are not interested in the end, so end then. So if the new development financial institution is going, don't let them think that we can lend money, unlend money to these PFS, PFIs, and they will do the right thing. They must take it on self that. That's why I say there's no question of rushing. Let us look at the capacity, technical assistance and capacity building, advisory services, business linkages, the end point of the business. All these things, they should be trained and it should be selected. Let me, Ben, let me give you, I'm able to speak like this because I was part of the export development project in 1985 at Social Security Bank. I had to be trained under Mr. Ahoy. I had to go out to be trained to visit them, know the sockets, know the planting distance, know the acreage. I know everything. So when I visit your farm, I know how much you're going to earn. The sprinklers, how we bought it from Israel. As a banker, I was trained to do that. And I'm telling you that we don't have the competencies and the skills that some of us got in those days because the, 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 the focus of the banks have changed from development into a retail banking. So those of you who are going to run the business, I urge you, Paul say, I beseech you and urge you, don't let technical assistance and capacity building get out of here. Other than that, it will be another waste of funds because we don't have the skills and the competences to look at this industry. And I'm quoting directly from the uh, World Bank report 2017 because it talks about this technical assistance to the, especially when you're doing the on, on lending uh, financing, because the banks are not been seriously been trained. It's not like in Europe, project will be different project will refer to a project department. Here it is just go and get CDs, sell the CDs, sell the foreign exchange, buy treasury, will make money. But you see, once you're going to go into production, production, the tilling of the land. I believe we even did a, better. Let me come back. The pineapple, even the soil, we tested, we sent the soil to uh, K, uh, Kumasi Soil Research to find which one would be suitable for pineapple. Doc, I, I, I wanted to, to, to say I'm enjoying your presentation so much, but you, you, your, your time is out. Oh, <laughs> so let me close that. Give us your. Your, your your last bullet point because we need to start the discussion proper. You've given us a nice foundation. Okay. I also want to apologize to uh, those on the main Zoom because we did about 10 minutes before you came. In. I'll give you a summary of what said before we continue the discussion. Those of you who are watching us on Facebook as well, we apologize because initially we were not streaming earlier. We fixed that now. So we'll give you a summary. You mixed Alexa, see this opening comment. You list the first part of the presentation. Look, if you don't mind, I'll cut you here, and then I'm going to get into specific comments. But by way of summary, yes, Dr. Estuani has a great idea, and he also says there are two types. There's a retail and a wholesale, and from what he's heard, this is going to be a wholesale thing, so that participating institutions then come for the funds, and they on lend. Fair enough. He's raised some very key concerns about how we should go. Corporate governance being number one, that we have to think about corporate governance very clearly. Number two, we need a definitive mandate, a definitive mandate. If the focus is too broad, it dilutes the purpose. So we need strategic focus. If it's rice, it's rice. If it's sugar cane, it's sugar cane. We shouldn't spread ourselves thin. And then he raised issues of financial survivability. Financial survivability. There's no point giving money to a project that's not going to bring back any return. And then he was developing his final point when I in in interrupted. So, Doc, 
Since you're on the panel, I will pause it here. Thank you for your presentation. What I want to do now is to bring in Samson Akligo. Samson is the head of financial institutions at the Ministry of Finance, Financial Institutions Division at the Ministry of Finance. Um, what I want him to do is to give us a, a few more specifics. Yes, we know there are different kinds of development banks. Give us one or two specifics because um, there are concerns about financial survivability, corporate governance, political interference, spreading ourselves too thin. What, what are some of the key differences with our development bank from what we generically know? Samson, that would be my opening question to you. You have the floor. Thank you for joining us. And those who join later, we will share later on the presentation of, of Doc into the chat page so you can have a hard copy. So forgive us for missing out. I will share a PowerPoint of what Doc Etiahini spoke about. So please forgive us. Samson, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. And um, I think that I will first, um, I mean, thank you for, for this uh, this event and inviting me. And also, I'm grateful that Impact Investing Ghana is very interested in this uh, important conversation. Um, I think that, um, I think if this conversation, especially listening to Alice, listening to Mr. Etuahini, is, um, is quite heartwarming, that the broad consensus is that, look, as a country, looking at our state of development, we need to find a way to make our country work better. Uh, I think when it comes to the impact invest, uh, investment uh, ecosystem, I think that they are very important to this initiative of, of getting the development bank to work. When I let's talk about the young people, when I look, I let's talk about going to the Eastern region and getting to realize the importance of job creation and jobs, I think that I have seen across the country how difficult it is for people like uh, Alex and his people to have access to long-term money. Um, I mean, I have been repeating uh, a couple of figures over and over again, and I indicated that if you look, if you ask where do Ghanaians put their money, and I'm looking at it from the supply side, you know, the figures we have tells us that, you know, 30, 36% of our money is sitting with commercial banks. And this one, uh, this one about 155 million, sitting in commercial banks, and the nature of how these monies are given to the commercial banks cannot help us to build businesses and grow and create jobs. Then you look at the figure from the, from where we can get money to create jobs and support the economy. Then you are being told that only 7% of our GDP is put in those assets. And what do I mean by those assets? Uh, I will start by talking about pensions, I'll start about uh, talking about uh, life insurance. I'll talk about the mutual funds. In every economy, access to long-term funds is one of the critical ingredients of, of economic development and growth. And, and clearly, uh, we don't have it. And then you, you listen to this report. That really creates a leverage for us to benefit from the Africa continental free trade area. And uh, it, it was very clear in the report that, look, Ghana has all the ingredients, but what we the most important ingredient that we don't have is access to long term, long term money, and and the, and 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 the sad thing is that you know we have a large segment of a private sector that is small, that is not big, and that sincerely cannot access uh, even bank credit because they don't have the things that uh, Dr. Ito Ahini described. So if this conversation is supposed to be to be set right, I think that there's no better platform than a platform of impact investing and a platform of venture capital and a platform of, uh, of uh, private equity. So I think that it is important for me to even start this conversation that the development bank, it, aside from the past histories that we had, one of the key differentiating factors is that, look, we have a focus in addition to the investor banks for non-bank uh, financial institutions like impact investing, private equity, the capital market players, that will make our economy benefit the real people. The people who would have the patience to work SMEs and businesses through a transformation plan and make sure that we don't repeat 
a lot of the mistakes that we've been doing in the past. And and really, the last thing I would say, especially uh, with respect to Alice, is that you see that fundamentally, anytime bank credits grow, the MPL situation most often than not becomes a bit scary. How do we minimize SME? We can do a lot of short-term decisions and say, let's improve addressing system. Let's improve this. But the real issue is that your, if you don't have right corporate governance, you don't have better marketing strategies, you don't have capital budgeting frameworks, your business cannot grow. And in every country, it is your venture capital, your impact investing people that support that ecosystem. So I would challenge the impact invest, uh, investing ecosystem that they must be ready for the investment bank, for the investment bank to be to be very, very meaningful and to create an impact. And I would welcome an immediate conversation as to how, I mean, they can be ready. Yeah. Then on the substantive issue, I think I really appreciate Dr. Etio in his point. I mean, uh, I like the fact that he drew our attention to the historical developments of um, of development banking in Ghana. Yes, as a country, we have tried it before. We tried it in, a, in an environment that it was very important. And when I listened to him, it's clear to me that even in the 1963, we set up the development bank in a way that fits the economy at that time, in a way that will make us really create impact. Unfortunately, he said that we have not been successful. And I think so. We, we have not been as much successful as we should be. So what makes our development bank um, different. I mean, the, the 2018 Development Bank that was announced by the Minister for Finance different. And I'll take my time and quickly go through some of the specifics. Uh, the first thing that Ms. Etuahini said was about, actually, Alex and Ms. Etuahini talk about influence of political uh, political and economic rent seekers. Uh, I've, I've heard the point about financial sustainability. I've also heard the fact that we should not rush. We should not rush it. We need to take our time. And so I, I will really spend some few minutes trying to address those. So the first one that I would take is that we shouldn't rush our time. Yes, I think it's a very legitimate concern and it is well taken. But, you know, we started this development bank in 2018. You know, the first, and actually we started the development bank prior to 2018, but our first official announcement on the development bank was made somewhere in 2020. But, and when that announcement was made, you know, we took our time, we put together a task force. That task force actually was made up of people like Mr. Etuahini, retired bankers, people, Ghanaians who have worked in the World Bank, Ghanaians who have worked in um, uh, Ghanaians who have worked in the investment banking industry in Europe. And some of the names are even public, retired, very experienced bankers, regional level. And then we didn't even end there. We even asked ourselves, hey, but some countries have been able to make development bank work. How do we get this expertise? The first people we went to was the World Bank. All the reports, the report that Mr. Etuahini referred to has been the chances of the World Bank engagement with government. I can tell you that the World Bank is a, more than a very important stakeholder in the preparation of this bank, in addition to our local experienced businessmen. The, the next thing we have also done is that, look, one of the countries that have successfully used development banks to transform has been the Germans. We reach out to the Germans. You know, then we also decided to broaden it, get experience from other countries like Singapore. So I think that we we have we have really taken a lot of these concerns into, into consideration. And therefore, we model the development bank to be a bit different. And one of the things that we did was that one, learning from our history, this development bank would not would not give direct loans to any business or any individual. That is one way that we realize that the former system is more is, is relatively easier to compromise. So we have designed a development bank that will work through the financial system. And the credit assessment and everything will depend on the work of the private sector. The second thing that we have also done is that we have worked to develop a development finance institutions act. And we set up this development bank, not under an act of parliament, but under the company's acts. And uh, this development bank will be supervised by the Bank of Ghana. And if you look at the framework that the central bank worked with government to develop, the development bank is going to have over 60% of independent directors. In fact, 
as a policy guidance, the ministry has even taken steps to virtually make all the board members, the, the intention is almost all the board members are going to be independent. You know, so that framework is very clear. And we did that because we want to learn from our past mistakes. Another thing that is also important is that the board and the management is being selected through a very competitive process. So it is not done through through, through uh, political appointments. The next thing that is also, I think I, I have to make uh, add to it is that the framework of setting the development bank has been, as I indicated, it are very wholesale. So you wouldn't have um, a situation where uh, you have a development bank that interface directly with the citizen. Then I also, the issue of financial sustainability, I think is, is also very important. One of the earlier challenges we had with our development banks was the excessive reliance on the treasury. It said that the Ministry of Finance have to be giving money to the, the development banks. When you have a development bank whose financial nucleus is solely tied to the treasury, I mean, all of us know how it works. So for the first time, this development bank is being set up in a way that it will be financially independent. And that is where the government is doing everything to make sure that it is properly capitalized. That is where the mandate of the, the policy guidance for the development bank is very clear that you must develop the instruments that can make you tap into the private capital market, both foreign and local. And that is why it's important that in the board selection, we have a framework that gives that global diversification that gets the development bank properly rated so that it can access cheap money from foreign capital markets. In addition to that, from the very beginning, we are making sure that the government uses its balance sheets to the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, the KFWs, to ensure that we, we give it a capital that will enable it to give competitive interest rates to, to, to the economy. And we are also working to develop a PFI framework that makes sure that you know, the ratio of the development bank's money, that even goes to financial institutions that are owned by governments, are restricted. You know, so you, you, we we have actually taken our time to make sure that as human as humanly as possible, the government takes the process so that we have a credible institution that is independent, have the adequate human resources that can do things differently from the past. And I think that this engagement process, as we continue, would enable the Ministry of Finance at this stage to provide more clarity on the vision. And then when the development bank starts, the board and the leadership will then continue the engagement so that we see how we can shift it. I don't, maybe the last thing that I will also address is that I think the policy focus is quite clear. Uh, but, you know, I think at the beginning it was made clear that we're going to focus on agri and industry. Yeah, the ancillary support to those things, which we all know now, is technology, the ICT, and, of course, housing. As your economy grows, you are creating more jobs. Those things must be provided. So that is how we are going to start. But I think another key, another key thing that is that I think two quick things that I will mention before I end uh, this comment is one. Uh, I think it is very clear to us that 75% of the, the money of the development banks must be given long term. I think it's even in the arts. So this is purely a long term institution. Uh, another thing that I think we also, uh, from the policy side, were very clear about is that there should be a strong real sector research component of the development bank. So the decisions of the development bank should not only be governed by where government says it should go, mm -hmm. but it should be governed by a strong, a strong fundamental core real sector research as to where the growth pillars of the Ghanaian economy are. And it is that research that will be the interface between policymakers and the development bank. So you realize that the adverse that even went out from the independent recruitment shows that there's going to be a chief economist at a very high level. I mean, I think on top of my mind, maybe a vice president level that will be responsible for leading a cutting edge research, which is different from a lot of the macroeconomic research that we have. So really, we get to start understanding beyond the rhetoric, where really we should be allocating the resources. So I saw this institution 
really is meant to be a very important catalyst to private sector growth. And uh, I really look forward to this conversation so that by the time the bank is launched, the policy guidance can be can be shaped so that we get a very a very new and renewed institution. So thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much, Samson Akligo. This is the Development Finance Series. It is brought to you by Impact Investment Ghana in partnership with CTFM CTTV. We're talking about the development bank that has been planned and what it will look like. So far, we've heard from the, I call him the economist for the day, uh, Dr. Richmond Etuahene, who laid the baseline and raised some key concerns about strategic focus, key concerns about corporate governance, financial sustainability. Our first response has come from um, Samson Akligo, who is the head of financial institutions at the Ministry of Finance, is basically saying, thank you for those comments. We agree the corporate governance is going to be strict. We are going to deal with influence of political people. We are not rushing. This started in 2018. directly to any person. So it's coming back to Dr. Richmond. This is not a retail development bank. This is a wholesale development bank. So far, so good. But let's hear from arguably one of the most accomplished entrepreneurs in Ghana. I think she's done it for at least 40 years, promoting indigenous business, successfully managing many, many companies. One of the first to benefit from the AGOA, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, where the U.S. market was open to us, duty-free, quota-free. She's also one of Ghana's most celebrated fashion designers. Nora Banaman Abbott is joining us. Her remit is not to do a presentation. We just want to hear her thoughts on what businesses like hers and smaller ones need and whether this idea of a development bank is even where we should be going at all. And if it is, what should they focus on so that smaller companies can benefit in the right way. Nora, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for your indulgence. Good morning, and please, you have the floor. Good morning, uh, Bernard, and good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen listening on. Uh, I would want to start by reminding us that the AFCFTA, that's the Africa Continental Free Trade, is a game changer for all medium, small and uh, macro enterprises in Ghana. And uh, depending on our preparedness, the AFCFTA will either make or break businesses in Ghana, including mine. Now I speak, well, you've introduced me. I've been indeed in industry for over 40 years now. I'm an executive of the Association of Ghana Industries, which is the voice of the private sector in Ghana. And uh, I was also in not, well, in the recent past, named as one of the top 20 female global business leaders by the World Bank's International Finance Corporation. So I speak as somebody who understands industry and what we require. And uh, one of the things that we need the most for most businesses in this country is to continue to expand our production capacities. The ASCFTA brings opportunities, but now we have competition knocking at our doors. And one of the biggest challenge for businesses in Ghana has been to access, has been access to finance. And it isn't the unavailability of finance, but the high cost of finance. Because most, in fact, all the banks are currently operating as universal banks. And not only that, but they charge such high commercial lending rates of 25 to 33%. And it is no wonder that so many uh, business owners ended up being scammed by these Ponzi schemes. Because if you're borrowing at such a rate, you definitely want to have something to fall back on. And some mistakenly thought that they could put their monies aside into this. But coming back to the question of uh, what we require, we really need to keep up with the competition. And one of that is to continue to replace obsolete equipment, continue to invest 
in the most modern of equipment so that we can increase our capacity. And such investments, including you know, infrastructure development, expanding our production facilities, such investments require long-term funding. We cannot operate with a short-term uh, finance that the banks are currently offering. And this is why it may seem as if local businesses do not understand business. We do not understand what we require. We do not appreciate that we need to be investing more. That is not our problem. The cost of finance is just too high. It already kicks us out of the competition, even on the domestic, domestic uh, markets, sorry, on the domestic platform. And now that we have AFCFTA, it has become even more urgent for us to expedite action on facing our challenges and finding solutions. So AGI is very excited. You know, we are happy uh, that government uh, is looking at um, establishment of this Development Bank of Ghana, because for several years, AGI itself has had on the drawing board the establishment of an industrial bank to service the manufacturing sector, because we appreciate what our problem has been and what has been our limitations and why it seems as if we are not able to compete with our competitors in other economies. So we are glad about this. But there's something I must add. You know, at the current circumstances, we are just coming out of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are not clearly out of the woods yet. And businesses have really suffered AGI would have also wanted government to have considered the establishment of a dedicated fund for AFCFTA. You know, that is to look at a fund that is purposely for developing local industry to be that competitive. So that's another area. Now, Dr. Etuahine interestingly mentioned other factors that we may not have been looking at. And I want to add this. You know, there are other needs that the private sector requires to be competitive, to make good use of every money that we may borrow or that we may receive. One of them, which Dr. Tuahini mentioned, was training for the staff of local banks who are going to be managing these funds. They need to understand industry. They need to be able to go out into the field, as he said he does, to appreciate the needs, to appreciate the challenges, and to also give advice because currently what is happening on the local front, for some of us, we do not call it banking. The other thing also is this, we also need to look at certain government policies and AGI is uh, you know, um, interacting with government. We need to look at reducing tax, the tax burden on businesses by expanding the tax net. We also need to look at the passage of the tax exemption bill, it's got to be streamlined because some have taken undue advantage of this, causing loss to government. And whenever there is a loss, unfortunately, those of us who suffer the most are those who are operating legally within the system because we get burdened with more tax. We need to expand this tax net. We need to look at plugging some of these holes without punishing those in industry. There are also certain levies and so on that we need to look at because there are certain raw materials that are unavailable locally. And placing taxes on these then causes our local products to be more expensive and uncompetitive. And believe you me, for those listening to us, we are at a point where we have no choice but to be that competitive. We need to work together, public and private sector, because ASCFTA comes with opportunities but is coming with a lot of competition. And everything is possible if we work together, understanding that we are in the same boat. So we are going to have funding available to us. And we are definitely hoping that this is going to be at competitive rates. And we are hoping that we are not going to operate as if we operate in isolation from the rest of the world, but that the competition is right at our doors. Let's take, for instance, the fact that um, we levy um, water. And yet, our neighboring countries place no taxes on, on, on water. It's an essential. So there are other areas that we need to look at, which is going to go side by side with this very commendable move by government, taking the bull by the horn to provide this very needed access to competitive finance. 
So this is what I have to say for now. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. I guess over 40 years in the industry gives you clarity. So you don't beat about the bush. You give me many, many bullet points. And as a journalist, one of the things you said was that what is happening in Ghana is not banking. It's something else. I thought that was a powerful bullet point. The fact that you need to replace obsolete equipment to make us competitive. And in fact, the report that something refers to that Confidant did with Busa also mentions the exact point you made. So we need to be more competitive. And as you said, after can be an opportunity or a threat depending on how we respond. So thank you for making the link between the development bank, private sector, and after. I think that's very nicely done. Um, I'm sure there are a couple of questions we'll ask you later on. But I want to bring in the final uh, jigsaw, the, the final piece in the jigsaw before we open the floor. So if you listen to something carefully, in responding to Alexis' intro, he says, there is a big, big role for impact investing, for venture capital, for private equity in all of this. Now, our next speaker works within that nice milieu. So his organization is the Ghana Venture Capital Association. But he's also, so he's the president of that, but he's also the CEO of Injaro Investments. They have a very healthy appetite for different kinds of investments in Africa. Now, what we want to understand from him, among other things, is how does the VC community feel about the development bank? That's number one. And how can the development bank help venture funds like his increase their support to MSMEs? Because I know they are very interested in supporting MSMEs as well. So is this competition or is this going to complement? So viewers, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to uh, bring our final panel member for the program, Jerry Parks. Jerry, take it up. Good morning. Thank you very much, Bernard, and uh, a very good morning to all um, your cherished listeners and, and viewers. So um, just to uh, recap, I represent the Ghana Venture Capital Association. I'm the vice president, uh, not, the, not the president. And this is an association of um, entities who are in the business of providing long-term capital for SMEs. So this is exactly the missing piece. Uh, because in all the previous interventions, um, the commentary was about banking. This is not banking. And the fact that the banks do not know how to deliver. But there actually already exists in Ghana an ecosystem of companies um, that are involved in the provision of long-term capital. And that is who the Ghana Venture Capital um, Association represents. So before I get into the um, the the specific answer to your question, Bernard. I'd also like to make some comments um, and also give some, just a few hints as to what we would be expecting from the development bank, which we think it is, is a good idea, by the way. So the, the very first point is we, we would strongly encourage the development bank to see its role as partly being um, strategic or being helpful in achieving Ghana's strategic objectives. I'll give very, a few very quick examples. Recently, in a speech in which uh, the president was launching the country financing roadmap for the sustainable development goals, he reminded all of us that chocolate is a $100 billion industry globally, but um, Ghana and Ivory Coast extract only about $6 billion of, this, of the value of this industry. Um, I think this is an example of the kind of strategic objective that the development bank should have as part of its, uh, you know, as part of its long-term objectives to ensure that if within the first three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, what can it do to help finance businesses in Ghana that can help redress this balance? Another example Dr. Tiahene referred to, which was rice imports. We should have the objective that as part of the work of the Development Bank and the partnerships it will engage in, we are going to reverse or significantly reduce rice importation. I'll add another one, and this is by virtue of Injaro being an, investment, an investor in the agriculture sector already. Um, why don't we also say that we are going to implement the, the plans of the DBG such that importation of broilers in, into Ghana completely stops? Because this one activity will create hundreds of thousands of jobs along the value chain. This is starting from farmers of soybean, farmers of maize, 
to the feed mills that will produce the feed, to the poultry farms that will produce the chickens, to abattoirs, to downstream packaging businesses, and create hundreds of thousands of jobs. So the, this is a kind of strategic um, mindset that we'd like the DBG to have in mind, even as it is I implementing its strategies. And the second point um, to add to it is that there already exists an ecosystem, and I probably alluded to this in the beginning, of here in Ghana, at least, you know, 10 to 15 companies that are already involved in venture capital, already involved in private equity, already involved in the business of providing long-term capital, and also already with the experience of dealing with um, development banks, because a lot of these inst institutions, um, like Injaro, like Oasis, um, like Wangara, already raise capital for international development banks and meet those already high standards for deploying capital into the, the ecosystem. Now, what is going to change, hopefully for the better, is that now we're going to have our own local development bank that understands the local terrain to partner with, and that will enable us to deliver even better value to um, our MSMEs. Uh, one particular area that's very close to my heart is the fact that most of the capital that we raise from abroad is raised in hard currency, euros, dollars, and is expecting a return in euros and dollars, which if we apply to our local MSMEs, means that uh, the, the, the rates that we demand from them will be very, very high. Um, and my, my hope is that the DBG will allow us to invest in local currency so that we can be more lenient or more understanding of the, of the needs of the local MSMEs. So it is really important that we um, leverage the local, um, the local existing ecosystem. But that being said, the number of companies that we have in this ecosystem is not enough. So there has to be a mandate and a, a very proactive, a pro proactive um, thrust towards building even more of these companies, right? So I said we have about 15 companies that are already positioned to do this work. We probably need 30, we probably need 40 or 50. So I think part of the resources of the bank has to be focused on proactively building the capacity of, of additional firms like ours so that we have a bigger army of people deploying this, this long-term long capital. Um, the, the next point I would add is that the, the bank needs to be ready to innovate, to suit the local, the local environment. When we think about innovations that have happened in Africa, like M-Pesa, they were born of the fact that African entities innovated to meet the needs of local, of local people. And this, in turn, allowed us to leapfrog what was already available um, in international markets. So in implementing, while we are relying on the inputs of the uh, development banks from Singapore, from KFW, uh, from Germany, and all these other places, let us also remain open-minded to the fact that we have the, um, the talent and the the intelligence here in Ghana to also innovate to solve problems that are, are, are particularly um, or, or particular to our local environment. So let us not go in there saying um, a PPE fund has to be a 10-year fund because this is what our development partners say. Um, you know, if we have made investments in Africa where it's taken 10 years to exit the investment. Now, if that is one investment in a fund, that almost suggests that you need a longer life fund in order to achieve the, the objectives of, um, you know, of job creation and return and actually developing and building, building businesses. Um, I think then that segues into the next point I'd like to make, is that, which is that our, our, we must have realistic expectations. We can't expect um, high return, high financial sustainability, building businesses all to happen at once and from day one. So, you know, we, we have to be aware that we are going through a learning process even as we are implementing. And I, I think I like Dr. Tiahani's idea where he says, we therefore have to take our time. Let us not be in a rush, right? So I think the fund is going to have something like $700 million available. I think that the, we should start with a phased approach where we're probably dispersing small amounts of money in the early years as we're innovating, as we're learning about the environment, as we're fine-tuning the structures for delivering the capital to SMEs. And then we can ramp up the um, deployment of capital as we've done some of the other preparatory work, like um, building the ecosystem, providing technical assistance, including to the MSMEs who are going to receive money, including to incubators that will help build and prepare SMEs for investment, et cetera. And um, so that we, we are in a better position to actually grow this, this entire uh, project going forward. Now, finally, uh, you know, given that investment in SMEs is not a... Uh, it's not a slam dunk. Not every SME is going to survive. Some of them will, will collapse. Some investments will lose money. 
I think we also have to be prepared for some level of replenishment of the capital of the development bank. It may, it may be on a five-year cycle, it may be on a 10-year cycle, but so long as we're achieving the broader goals of um, job creation, um, of increased survivability of SMEs in which investments have been made, let us be prepared to replenish the funds to be able to continue doing the, um, the work going, going forward. So these, these are some of the, um, the, the, the key comments that I, I thought it would be, I'd like to share on, um, on how the, the DBG should be implemented. But all in all, we think it is a great program. And um, I like some of the things Zach Sampson said around ensuring that they're independent directors, uh, properly recruited with the right source of background, uh, right sort of vision. And I think if we do this in a way that makes it foolproof or um, impregnable to changes in, in government, et cetera, this would be a really, really great initiative. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, Jerry. Awesome, awesome presentation. Uh, dealing with some key pieces of advice before answering my question. And what hit me, the bank must be ready to innovate. I think that's a powerful point. We also need realistic expectations. You are suggesting a phased approach, which is amazing. You also think that the DBG must think of building the ecosystem. I didn't think about that. The ecosystem has about 15 of companies. We need 30, 50. I'm not sure if, if they started doing that, Dr. Chahini would not say they are going away from their Monday, they are spreading themselves too thin. <laughs> well, that, but, but what we know is that once you are the leader in any sector, growing that space is also part of your mandate. So we'll see how the cookie crumbles there. There is a... needs of this meeting is being sector. recorded i just wanted to find out if you had any quick comebacks because you, you you sort of gave us a lot of food for thought at the beginning so doc just a couple of minutes quick comeback on anything you've heard so far before i open the floor to, to the rest of the, the the viewers please make sure your, your 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 mic is on your mic is off thank you So I'm sure he needs help. His, his mic is off, so please uh, put his mic on and so he can talk to us. Good. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Doc, you're on. Go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. I think I like the bit of uh, what Mr. Pack said. I think he said he sums it all, and I like the way he went around it, and I like about what. And Tinora also said, because I've dealt with him in the Agua, in the Agua, yeah, I've dealt with him. And I think they do understand the business. And I believe if we can even get people like that to be on the board, it will set the very good agenda for the business because he's been in for 40 years. I've known him when he was in Agua. I was, up, I was also in a bank. And I believe if we can get people like that to cram up at the board, I believe we will be able to turn this country around. The development bank, let me say it, it is the only way forward for us to turn this economy, to improve, to reduce poverty, uh, poverty alleviation, job creation, the huge unemployment, and economic growth. So I think of all that I've heard, I think it's a laudable and a very interesting program. I have a direct question for you. One of the biggest threats to anything we do in Ghana is lack of political continuity. Four year, eight year change in government. Everybody wants to start afresh. How do you think this government should go about this so that even if there's a change in government in four years or eight years or whatever, it does not suffer the fate of some good projects which have become white elephants because we didn't build political will across before starting it? 
You know, uh, Bernard, the simple thing is that we don't seem to have a national agenda. What we have, we have political agenda. And a nation should have its own national agenda, which will be pursued by all political parties. We'll build consensus. Because this program, this uh, development, uh, development banking, I think is a lot of, but they, they should have been consultation even with those who are not in the party. <laughs> so that, you see, so that we can build something that will be, be a, a, time, a, a time for 10 years to come. But this country, we don't have consultation. They, they sign you, as I speak to you, if I tell you how I have suffered, because I speak a lot, they tell me with so many names, Today, as I speak today, today you hear the name they will call me. Immediately I step out. Bernard, you will be very surprised. I like what Samson said. He even said that they consulted people like me. I'm not saying he didn't, he didn't consult me. But the point is that we don't do consultation. We don't do stick. You've done very well. Let me comment CTFM and the investment. You've done very well. Because you are the only station who are bringing people together to see where we are going and where we want to end up. Other than that, it becomes a political thing time. People bring in and talk. But the way you listen to everybody, everybody is explicit in their own field, expertise, com competences. So I think if the nation wants to go forward, we must have consensus building and having a national agenda. Other than that, eight years, eight years, this one is down. Eight years, this one comes in. We cannot go anywhere. Countries like Chile, let me cite an example, Chile. Chile decided that they would do development banking. Do you know what they do? It's only for the forestry. Now they control export of paper and pulp to almost all the European countries, billions of dollars. So I believe if we have a national agenda, we can build consensus about this issue. That's why I want to commend you again. You people have done well, and I grease to your elbow. Continue to do that, because this is the only forum that different people with background, those of us who they have aligned with so many political parties, can speak <laughs> our minds. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Samson, I, I don't know if you're there. Your, your video, I can't see you. I wanted to bring you back in. I am here, Bernard. On a couple mm -hmm. of things. So Nora was very brief, but very powerful, where she says, if they can't compete, after will destroy them. So after is a double-edged sword. And she says they need money to replace obsolete equipment. Now, I want you to give us some assurances that the thinking of the people behind this is tailored towards that. Then secondly, Jerry made some very powerful points. He says, number one, you need to grow the ecosystem because it's not just 15 companies that are going to make this work. You need to grow the ecosystem. Number two, he says, you need to have realistic expectations and probably have a phased approach because you want to make sure it's working. You don't want to waste the $700 million because you're going to then run into problems. And then he also talks about other things. I just wanted your quick response to Nora and Jerry in terms of the concerns they raised in their presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Bernard. I mean, when Dr. Etiahine was speaking, I was just wondering that maybe he's also a prophet so <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah Bernard, i i think that um i've listened to nora and quite frankly people like him i mean i think are the real heroes of our country i mean i you see we you know the conversation of a successful development bank cannot be had in um in a contest of um, of calling the government. So when we have forums like this, and you listen to people like Nora, you listen to people like Jerry, then you get, um, it's quite heartwarming. I think that it is very clear to me from all the policy conversations and the work. You know, I quite remember the World Bank in particular also from a whole big team in helping us to come up with the framework for the development bank. And some of the people in their teams were from Chile. <laughs> you know, they had a very, very broad team, you know. And when I even saw it, I was like, oh, my goodness. But I realized it took a lot of time, but it was very helpful. And it, it, it was clear to us that we must make the development bank work for people like Nora 
but and also work for people like Jerry. And that is why the minister keeps saying that the development bank, you know, in public, a lot of the conversation quickly shifts to banks, banks, banks. But anytime the minister is speaking, you realize that he say banks and non-banks. The whole idea is that there must be some deliberate commitment to see how do we ensure that the whole ecosystem and the financial architecture is developed around the development bank. And then we also realize that we have been that we have been repeating, especially the minister has been repeating every day, that whole, the development bank is going to support the retail development bank or institutions. He mentioned ESIM, he mentions uh, ADB, and of course, all those, inst- and or even GIF, because we also realize that the UK is trying to see how they can even deploy an investment uh, development bank to support, in fact, even Ghana was was really started this before that conversation even started in the UK. So for me, I think that as a country, we're just lucky that we started working on this development bank for a long time. And then then COVID came. Then we also have situations where there is a heightened demand for, for jobs because educational system continue to open up and create more educated young people who need support. And I think that if there is anything that I would add before probably I go to the last, the, my last point is that, look, I think it's so important, Bernard, that these development banks must work. And it must work for young people. I mean, it is just so important. And it must be bipartisan. I mean, I think it is so important that this development bank must work. We've tried it before. We have achieved some success. We have learned from what we have done in the past, and we are trying to do something better. So it must work. It must work for young people, and it must be bipartisan. And being bipartisan, what we have, what the government has done, quite frankly, is that you know one of the most extensive process of passing a development finance act is to ensure that that bipartisan process is anchored. So through the Development Finance Act, a lot of work has been done with Parliament, both sides of Parliament. And then we have built expectations and the framework for what we want to do. And I think that there must be continuous conversation as to how we are going to do this going forward. But I can assure you that that it took three years to get this development bank to, to, to come to fruition. And one of the key things is the bipartisan nature. The second thing is that, the, you know, the professional engagement there was an engagement in 2018, 2019. Those engagements were done by PwC India, I remember. And through those engagements, a lot of private sector people, including commercial banks, the life of the capital market players were, were engaged. And that even set the tone for the whole work. So, yes, we need these conversations to improve, especially on the side of government uh, up to the launch, where we hand over to the professionals who will then be in the business of getting this thing to work. Uh, but we also, uh, we must also know that the discipline approach to this development bank is very painful. And I look forward to see how we can really get uh, people like Dr. Etiola Haney, people like Nora and the rest to see, like maybe in very practical and straight terms. Okay, look, we have done something. We want to get there. Let's come to the to the government. Let's see, okay, what are the three, four things that we need to continue to do so that we can we can get there? Because at the end of the day, yeah, this institution is, is very is very important. Um, it's very important for us, uh, especially the future of the country. And again, this institution is going to benefit from the entire ecosystem. When I get a chance again, I will talk that the development bank is one top institution, but there are other key initiatives in the financial sector that are supposed to anchor the development bank as well. And I think that all these are, are right. very important uh, going Thank forward. You. Thank you. I want to announce that it's 11.30. We advertised 10 to 11.30, but because we started over 20 minutes late, we want to plead with participants to bear with us for us to run till the top of the hour. So please forgive us because we have technical problems at the beginning. <clears throat> so Dr. Etiahini and Jerry, they both keep talking about ruthless focus, ruthless focus, strategic focus. For example, Jerry said some people are doing just chocolate or rice imports 
or just broiler imports. Focus on one thing. I noticed in your comments you said you were looking more about which aspect of business needs support, as in getting new equipment. You didn't so much go into sector. You didn't so much go into sector. Is there any particular reason why you prefer to look at the aspect of business that needs support as against the sector that the bank should focus on, Nora? Um, see, as an executive of the Association of Ghana Industry, I just wanted to put forward the needs of industry at large. But what has been stated here is so true. It is very important to be very target, targeted, to be focused. Now, there are certain sectors that generate a lot of employment. For instance, the garments and the textile sector. If we look at the countries like the US, like China, they entered into manufacturing through garments and textiles. That's a very critical area. You know, the entry point is easy, although it involves a lot of investment, infrastructure, equipment, and skills development. That's one area. And then agriculture. We have arable land, we have the potential, COVID has taught us the importance of organic foods. Ghana should be doing very well in that area, for instance. We are doing well with rice um, production, but unfortunately, certain policies need to be looked at so that we are more competitive and then we are not overrun by the imports. So I didn't mention those sectors, but it is very important for us to approach this in a very targeted way. And uh, we have to look at agriculture. We have to look at garments and textiles. We have to look at ICT for sure, because globally we are going digital. It's so important for marketing, for protecting your own markets and so on. And then there is something I mentioned that you missed out. I spoke about public and private sector partnerships, but there's also the need for public and public sector partnerships. The Ministry of Finance does need the partnerships of other ministries, departments, and agencies. I'm going to pick an area where people don't pay much attention to and we don't think much of. That is in the area of our imports. You know, let me look at my, let's take my sector, for instance. Why are we still importing uniforms into this country? And uh, I'll, I'll mention a very sensitive point, but we need to be very open and plain if we really want to get somewhere. There's this national census exercise ongoing. So I called to find out about uniforms for the people on the field. And guess what? I found out that uniforms have already been imported into the country. I can only say imported because I'm at a position where I know what is being manufactured in most factories in the country, which means that rather than give these contracts to locally established factories, there are local investors who are putting so much and this is why I didn't even want to be specific in certain areas. There are investments, local investors, and we need to protect this because the growth of our economy is reliant on these manufacturers. So we need the partnership of these um, agencies, these departments. They need to partner with the Ministry of Finance to make this work. What is the use of providing necessary funding at competitive rates? And then we continue to import in bulk into the country to compete with the very manufacturers that, you know, or the manufacturing sector that we're trying to grow. We wouldn't be making sense. So we all need to work together. We, are, we must understand we are in this together and we must survive. We must survive for so many other sectors. There are things that are of concern to us. These will only work if the manufacturing sector is successful and our economy is successful. So I Thank hope you. I have. Thank you, Nora. Uh, I've heard a, a few things in my life. I didn't know about public public partnership. I, I'll make a note of that. I'll read around that, but I'll also ask something to comment on that later because I think it's a very powerful point you've made. I just wanted to ask Jerry a, a quick question on agriculture and agribusiness. Uh, uh, Jerry, because your time was short, you didn't elaborate a lot on what you wanted to say. But I keep hearing strategic focus, and a lot of the examples I'm hearing are in agriculture. With Injaro and what you do, you really know how agriculture works. You put some long term in agriculture. What, what is the key to getting it right when it comes to giving long term money to agriculture for a strategic reason? 
I just wanted you to elaborate a bit. You gave a chicken example. You gave some rice examples. Just, just give us a few more insights into, if we are going to focus on agri, how should we think about that investment? And how can we make sure that it works? Because now it's government procurement that can also help. So just give us a bit more insights there, Jerry. Thank you very much, Bernard. So, um, you know, investing in agriculture fundamentally isn't very different from making any other investment. And the success of the investment, um, in my view, starts from the viability of the end market, right? So the reason why I picked, um, for example, um, importation of rice, um, importation of broilers uh, and chocolate is that in all of these markets have an established end user demand, right? Chocolates are eaten all over the world. So if you can um, backward integrate and invest into a company that is manufacturing chocolate in Ghana, you can almost be rest assured that once the branding and the sales and marketing is done, you can get that chocolate sold. Um, and I think for imported products, it's even easier because you've already demonstrated a local demand for the product. You know what price people are prepared to buy that product at. So then you have a target um, production cost that you're trying to achieve at the level of the company. So if a company is able to achieve that production price, then they can, in principle, sell the product um, to, into that local market, substitute the import, and keep those profits in Ghana, create those jobs in Ghana. Now, I'd like to allude to what Nora mentioned, which is a public-public partnership. I probably like to call it joined up or coordinated strategy between different government uh, departments. So let me take the example of, say, um, a local fruit juice processor that's trying to take advantage of local production, say of pineapple, oranges, et cetera, package fruit, and then sell it to our local, our, our local um, grocery stores. You juxtapose this with the fact that you probably have a huge importer of juice passing products through the ports, not paying taxes or duties, and as a result, being able to deliver that same product onto the shelves at a lower price than the person who's producing it locally. This is an example of how the lack of joined up strategy or effective implementation of government policy across several departments can actually impact an investment. So suddenly you move from a situation where on paper, local production of that fruit juice should have been viable. But because from an execution perspective, customs is not levying the right duty or someone is taking a bribe somewhere, suddenly you've blocked the opportunity for a local um, agribusiness to be viable, right? So um, it is very important that government recognizes that if we want to achieve any one of these strategic objectives, a very careful analysis, end-to-end -end analysis of all the various contributing parts of the value chain has to be done to ensure that when an investment is made in that SME, that is trying to tap into that rice opportunity, that is trying to tap into that um, chocolate opportunity, when that investment is made, it, is, it doesn't get frustrated by the fact that certain other um, enabling elements are failing or are not, are not performing. And this is something that we see in our business on a day-to-day -day basis because we have to deal with it at a, at a, micro, at a micro level. Um, but other than that, generally, you need to have, as with other investments, strong teams with the right sort of skill sets, strong corporate governance, very strong financial management, actually stronger in agriculture than, than anywhere else. I often like to say that um, agribusiness is probably one of our tougher sectors to operate in, and yet we often leave it to our least qualified people. So if there's an appeal I can make, it is for our, our talented young Ghanaians to go more into agribusiness, apply the technology, apply the new ideas, and, and hopefully help to build the sector a little more. Um, thank you. Over. You just developed the agri investors paradox, the agri investors paradox that agribusiness requires the greatest skill, yet we leave it to the least skilled. It's almost like the innovator's dilemma. Jerry, I'll credit you for that. Thank you for those insights. I want to read some comments from the public, then I'll bring the discussion home for final responses, because there's a comment that I feel we should let something address. I don't want to make it back and forth. So I'm going to start off with the Zoom comments with the zoom comments um bright pa Akpapavi says from the discussion it appears the issue with inadequate financing to industry from the bank is the continuous increase in mpls if the financial landscape is not enhanced to correct the increase in mpls by the establishment of 
an efficient and transparent credit bureau, the banks will still face the same challenges in disbursement of funds from the development banks. My question is, does the BOG, with the oversight of the development bank, have plans to strengthen credit bureaus? So this question is to BOG. This is not the only conversation, but uh, Samson, take note of this question. If MPLs are high for traditional banks and universal banks, what makes you think that if development bank gives the money to another institution, the MPL ratio will still not be high? Good question from Bright. Second question from Adelaide Norte. This is a, it says, I would like to know which vacancies will be available since it is a wholesale banking move. Are there going to be branches available? Bernard, my fear was the political continuity on jobs in our country. So Adler is asking about job creation with the bank itself in terms of how many people will be employed. Will they have branches? I suspect the answer to that will not make Adler too happy because this is a wholesale bank. So probably I just want one, one, one unit less than 100 people, Adler. But I, I won't answer. I'll let somebody answer that question. Another comment from Zoom, Seth Kunedu Ewa. He says, there are a lot of opportunities with the aerospace and aviation industry in Ghana to foster economic growth and development through education and training, provision of capital for startups in aviation and tourism. We can generate a lot of revenue through the promotion of domestic tourism and air travel. There are lots of innovations and creativity going on in that sector. What role can the banks play to bring some of these innovations to fruition? Seth, we want to narrow down. You are broadening us. We want to narrow into poultry or broilers. You are taking us into aviation. Thank you for your comment. Um, Opei Muoyome. Opei Muoyome says, Ghana is fortunate to join the few League of Nations with development banks. This government has taken a bold step to initiate this. What is left is a conscious effort in ensuring sustainability and ensuring the expected outcomes are strictly adhered to. So that's from Opei Muoyome. Let me go to Facebook. Let me go to Facebook and read some quick comments. Um, Felix Flexiboy, Felix the Flexiboy says, if I understood the director well, 75% of funds will be long-term funds. So I suggest it should be channeled to pre-financing government capital projects like roads. Wow. Different idea. <laughs> he says we should pre-finance government capital development project like roads. Dr. Tiahini, you are laughing so hard. Well, that's Flexiboy's view. That's Flexiboy's view. He also says, better as the director of finance to throw more light on the first point he made, saying that development banks will not lend to private individuals. I don't get that point clearly. Well, I can answer that question. His point is that they are either retail or wholesale development banks. Retail development banks deal directly with uh, borrowers. The, the wholesale lend to organizations who then on lend. So that's what he says. It doesn't mean you won't get the money. It won't come directly from them. So I've answered that question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give uh, Samson just two minutes to respond to some quick questions. Finance Ministry, can you help with public, private, public, public sector linkage, a coordinated strategy? Nora and Jerry asked that question. There was also a question about non-performing loans and whether the Bank of Ghana shouldn't be strengthening credit uh, bureaus to make this process work. And then somebody wants to know whether they can get a job in a branch. I know you'll disappoint them. Samson, you have the floor as we try and wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the first one is, the first thing is that, yes, I think I should even answer the face approach. Yes, uh, Jerry actually emphasized that point. I, I know that because we have um, we have a pipeline of funds from the EIB, the World Bank, a lot of people are thinking that we are going to get 700 million and then it will come to the bank uh, immediately. No, it's actually a phase or a tranching of the uh, a tranching of the of this whole finance, especially aside the equity and the tier two capital. Everything is going to be um, uh, everything is going to be uh, phased. And I think it's important that I make that point. The second one is that, you know, luckily for us, because of the COVID and then the response to COVID, uh, you know, the, the Ministry of Finance and the entire government has come to us a coordinated approach 
to really getting the economy to recover and then and also revitalize the, the private sector. And so by that, we have the, the Ghana CARES program, which, you know, government has been using. So any coordinated approach, uh, especially in the first phase of the development bank, is likely to dovetail into the CARES program. So a lot of the, uh, the areas that Nora mentioned, especially the textile industry, and all really reflected in the in the CARES program. And I think that that is, uh, that is important. In terms of the branches, Bernard, I think you've done a good job. Every job in the development bank will be true. I mean, quite frankly, it's going to be to a competitive process. And then uh, we, it's not, uh, it's a wholesale bank, so there will not be branches. There will not be so many branches, you know, or in the first, in the first several years, there's going to be one, <laughs> one, one, one office for the development bank because it works through other financial institutions. And then I think the other question is that, in fact, I think that uh, in answering the issue of MPLs, I mean, the first thing, I think I'll say three things quickly. The first one is that, yes, I think the central bank has been doing some work to get the credit reference bureaus uh, to be to be enhanced. And I think that process uh, really has been, uh, I mean, we, we've done a lot of work on that, but we will still continue to, to make it better. But fundamentally, I mean, one of the key pragmatic steps of giving money to SME is that we must get, as I said at the beginning, you see, when you get your private equity firms, your venture capital, those people just don't give credit to institutions without tackling the real things that those institutions need. So if you want to reduce your MPLs, one of the basic things that we need to do as an economy is to formalize a lot of this SME. And that is why we are very key to make sure that the capital market institutions that do those things are ready. And I think I made that point very strongly uh, in my earlier presentation. And I think that uh, the last key point is that I think that the development bank is being, is being worked on, is going to be launched. We are tackling a lot of the questions that are coming from people. And I'm really very happy about the focus on government because as for government, is we know the responsibility that is required to do the right, and it's very, very hard. And I think we've tried to answer that. But I think the last aspect that should not be lost on us is the private sector readiness. You see, that, that private sector readiness, the key part that I think we need to do at the Ministry of Finance is to probably continue the engagement process and deepen it as you're about to launch the bank. But there's also a lot of responsibility on the AGI on the SME space, the associations and everything, the the venture capital association, the impact investor climate to make sure that they are ready so that whatever capital the development bank is having can be deployed at a faster speed so that we can see the progress of the intervention on the economy and jobs very fast. Because you all know that this development bank is a private sector model it's a credible institution. It's just going to give money to institutions that are well run, and that are capitalized, that have capacity to expand. And therefore, it is not an institution that is just going to give money to private sector institutions that are not ready. So what mechanism does the private sector need to put in place so that our businesses will have the capacity to access the credit, both from the commercial banks and from the non-bank financial institutions? I think that is also another big debate that, uh, Bernard, we need to take up and see what we can do so that the responsibility of government and the responsibility of the, of, of the private sector in being ready for this institution uh, is, is actually that equilibrium is, is achieved. Uh, I think that is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me take Jerry a quick comment on MPLs. You already deal with institutions. How are you able to make sure you get your money back? Um, so, actually, I wanted to make a, a, a more um, high-level comment on the MPLs. That part of the reason why we see high MPLs in our banking sector is because there are a lot of MSMEs taking the wrong type of capital for the stage of life of the business. The average entrepreneur in Ghana has an idea, and the first thing they say is, oh, let me go to the bank for a loan. When in reality, at that stage of their business, they probably need equity, i.e. patient capital that could wait a few more years before expecting the first repayment. Uh, 
And because they're so keen to get the bank finance, they go to the bank and say, oh, if you give me this money in six months, I'll start generating cash. The bankers don't have the capacity to check whether this is true. They make the loan and then there's a default and NPLs go high. So one of the key things that the development bank will be doing is filling the financing gap with the right type of capital for each stage of the business. So in some cases, it's going to be early stage equity, growth stage equity, um, or in some cases, it could be um, cash flow based lending through credit funds who will be able to lend uh, money to companies with a lower need for collateral than you would expect from a deposits taking institution. So I just thought it was important to add that perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just read one final comment from Facebook, and then I'll take closing remarks from everybody. Yao Pebi is asking, Dr. Yao Pebi, he's asking, is our development not too piecemeal? What is the overarching national dream and strategy to which this development bank piece should contribute? I'd love to see a simple diagram that captures the Ghanaian dream all the essential contributing elements. Very interesting question. Probably you'll list that into your closing comments. I'm going to give each panelist um, two minutes to wrap up. I'll start with Dr. Tuyahini. Um, you, you set us off. What are your, 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 your key takeaways? Then I'll come to Nora. Then I'll come to Jerry. Then I'll end with Samson before I bring Ama from uh, IIG to, 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 to give us some way forward. So, Doc, please put his mic on. Just give me your final quick comment on, on what we've learned so far. I think, Bernard, um, my issue is the technical and capacity building of the participating financial institutions and other non-financial non institutions. I believe that emphasis should be there to train those who are going to receive these monies very well. Because I don't think at the moment, from my experience, I don't think from my experience, we have the skills and competences to deal with the areas. So I urge, I urge something that he should look at capacity building, technical assistance and capacity, so that we can set in every PFI, we can have a unit designated as a project office whose job is to handle this and do it expectedly. And this, they have to be trained in the skills we are talking about because Jerry was talking about Greek. Recently, I took a trip, as I told you, I visited one of the largest pineapple producer and uh, manufacturer. And when I went there, I saw a lot of things being done that we need to, to replicate. But I wonder whether those who are going to assess the credit, the, the, uh, the institutions, will they have the competences to be able to help the industry? That's why Nora said that they are not bankers, if you remember her first comment. And it is true. The last 10, 20 years, I've been in the industry. I think that skill has gone out of the industry and everybody is talking about retail. So I urge something that she should not lose track of capacity building and technical assistance to the PFIs and the non-banking to be able to let them deliver to, to support the growth of the economy. That's my only comment now. Thank you, sir. Nora, I'll give you the, the next uh, platform. Um, Bernard, on a lighter note, I sent the flyer to a friend, and his comment was, don't let the men bully you. I happen to be. <laughs> I want to thank, let me thank for your very kind words. I do appreciate that very much. I want to say that uh, Dr. Tuahini and all the panelists, really, and Samson, have put forward very uh, important uh, contributions. Mine has been very easy private sector, most of you already know our challenges and our difficulties and so on. Uh, I just wanted to add one more thing. Dr. Tuahini, you've mentioned the technical know-how. Uh, when I first exported under AGOA, what in 90 days was to have brought in technical expertise from Sri Lanka. We have not been paying attention to that very need for most factories. It is so expensive. You know, um, I'm serving on a, a board now. You know, well, I was serving on a board. Uh, it's a skills training and entrepreneurial development uh, institution. And uh, we are looking at boosting technical skills locally. But we have some way to go. 
So there may be the need for, this is why I spoke about the public, uh, public sector partnerships. There may be the need for, let's say, the Ministry of Trade and Industry to look at how to provide technical assistance. Technical assistance to go with training for our local uh, personnel, you know, maybe for a period of two years, but an intensive training. You know, Dr. Etuin, you, you mentioned training because you understand it, as you rightly said. You understand what it takes. Training for manufacturers, you know, for uh, factory floor management, and training also for staff of the banks. These are so critical if we're going to be successful. And, you know, I want to keep mentioning that local entrepreneurs are doing so well. They're creative, innovative ideas. There's the tenacity and something you, you passed a very, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for what you said that, you know, we, we should be celebrated. We've been through a lot and we are still standing, but there is a lot that we have to give and we are going to grow our economy. We are the engine of growth. We keep saying it, but we have to make it real and the support must come. Technical assistance to grow factory floor expertise is so important. It's so key. Entrepreneurs know what they need. They know what the market needs. We have built businesses around the needs of, of uh, our communities and so on. Global needs, we understand it. Some of us have access, uh, you know, international markets. We are able to do so, but there are various things that we need to deal with on the ground and we have to attack this. Thank you, Nora. Let me now bring in uh, last but one, Jerry, I, I don't know if Jerry is there or he's dropped off. I think Jerry is dropped off. So let me bring in uh, Samson for your closing comment. Yeah, thank you very much, Bernard. Um, I really and, and quite honestly appreciate this, this conversation. Uh, the first thing that I will say is that uh, we must make the private sector as the engine of growth work. And, uh, and this conversation requires that, you know, a lot of people, including especially the young people, know that when you are looking for jobs, when you are looking for opportunities, that collective idea that how do we make sure that our country works and that is a private sector that must create jobs, not government, is so fundamental. And the Development Bank is one way that we, we want this to, to happen. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the issues that have been raised, yes, I think that we identify a lot of issues. All the efforts that have been done is to make sure that we, 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 we prepare this particular institution to respond to them as much as possible. And we welcome any ideas and views going forward because it is in the collective interest of, of, of the country. In terms of capacity, yes, that is also important. Uh, you know, we have, uh, for the banking sector, we are experimenting that capacity building again with Gessel. And I think that the banks through the National Banking College are being supported so that they are trained on agricultural value chains and everything so that they understand the business and then they support it with financing. And I think that at the development bank level, that support will continue. We already have uh, grant facilities from KFW and I think even under the World Bank to, to get that, that care. And even our own Ghana Care Program have funding that is available to train, the, uh, to train the government. Also, on a broader level, one of the reforms under the Ghana Economic Transformation Progress was to transform MBSSI into the Ghana Enterprise uh, Agency. And uh, the idea about the Ghana Enterprise Agency is very important. Actually, part of the, the key things to show that this public, public, the ministries working together is there, is to make sure that the enterprise Ghana, for short, you know, just similar to what happens in Singapore, provides the needed training and skills uh, to the private sector. And I think that we should also take our eyes there and see how we can make that institution uh, more impactful for training uh, especially the SMEs across the, the country. And lastly, uh, in terms of the development bank, the development bank is looking at the entire ecosystem of the financial architecture. You know that we already have very important institutions like the, the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, the Ghana ESIM, 
uh, the Ghana Exim Bank. We also have interventions through the GATS, the GAT banks, and then some local banks. Uh, then we also have the Capital Market Master Plan. And through the capital market plan, government also has done a lot of policy interventions to make sure that the venture capital, the private ecosystem, and then also the the, the, the private equity funds all work collectively so that when a development bank starts, we can see that policy coordination. There's also a conversation to learn from the likes of um, South Africa through the, 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 the PIC, to learn from Singapore through Tamasek and see how we can actually position the country to start thinking, I mean, fundamentally about equity financing, as opposed to this whole idea about debts. Because every, as Jerry said, every businessman who starts a business wants debts. Debt is not the capital that is required uh, to, to grow the private sector, especially at the beginning. And so, I mean, I hope that in the next couple of two to three years, the development bank will superimpose on this all architecture and then we see from the the efforts in financial sector development side we can see how mm -hmm. we can get the financial architecture ready uh, to support right. private sector led growth and economic development so thank you bernard thank you, and uh, thank you everybody thank and you the so audience much. and, and my colleagues thank you i appreciate it uh, Jerry, I'm going to skip you because I think you spoke before the final round and we lost you, So, but I'm sure your points are well made. What I want to do finally is to bring in uh, really what the person we, we, who conceptualized this idea with, with us at City, Amalati, who's the chief executive of the Impact Investment Ghana, or Impact Investing, forgive me, Impact Investing Ghana, to, to give us some sort of more information about IIT because it's new in Ghana, and also what else we can expect from them going forward because we know that it's not just one program they're doing they they really want to take up the clarion call to grow the ecosystem so ama thank you for joining us i'm giving you the last word which also will be a vote of thanks so you are doing everything for us <laughs> before you go so ama please take it up thank you bernard um what a great discussion it has been and we started off with alex sharing his vision of what this means practically for a young person. And I will end by talking about how innovation happens. Innovation happens when you put people who are different in a room and begin to have conversations, ask the right questions, and follow up on those conversations with concrete action. So when questions are asked about procurement, concrete action follows. That means that some business is getting a contract and some innovation is enabling a startup to get financing. And that is what Impact Investing Ghana is about. We are a private sector-led initiative to drive innovation to increase impact investing in Ghana. Impact investing is simply investing with a clear social or environmental impact in mind that you measure and you drive. And we do things like this conversation, bringing people together to innovate about things that are going to be done by government or the private sector to ensure that we're building better. We're building um, things that are, are better suited for our country and we're creating a strong enabling environment. We also do um, things to develop the capacity of the ecosystem to deploy and absorb capital. We're doing a project now with pension funds. We support asset owners like pension funds, even individual um, 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 investors to understand what impact investing is, to understand how within the constraints of Ghana, they can ensure that their capital is achieving um, impact in addition to financial return. We do training for fund managers, we support enterprise support organizations that didn't come out so strongly in this conversation, accelerators, incubators, um, and other support organizations that are a very vital part of the ecosystem if we want to grow MSMEs in, in Ghana. And then we do research. We're currently doing a baseline ecosystem mapping research. It's the first in Ghana to really identify all the organizations, including the very unusual ones, that don't come up in most international reports to identify the gaps, to learn from what has worked well in the past and to be able to create a baseline so we can track change 
and the impact of our programs and other programs on the ecosystem. So there's a lot of exciting things that will be happening this year. There'll be dialogues like this one, and there will be training programs. We will have the research report that we hope will really help everyone make um, better decisions about how to use impact, how to use impact as a tool. Um, and, and we look forward to and being able to invite uh, um, more of you to some of those events. We're part of a global network called the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. And through that, also partner with other African countries who also have similar organizations um, to drive impact investing. So thank you so much, Bernard. And thank you, panelists, for um, spending this time with us and with our audience to really talk about how we can make this development bank work well for Ghana, work well for entrepreneurs, work well for impact. Thank you very much, Amma. And we are very proud to be associated with you at City. Uh, just by way of thank yous, I want to thank Dr. Richmond Etuahene for your, your, your patriotism and your scholarship. I really appreciate what you do. And it's good I've met you personally now after a long time. Thank you. I want to thank Mrs. Nora Banaman Abbott you are just an example for all of us. We are so proud of you, and we are willing you on. Jerry Parks, you, you are the kind of voice we need. And I, I hope you take up the offer if they put you on any of these boards, because you, are, you, 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 you know your onions very well. So please don't say no if any offer comes up. In addition to what you are doing with the Ghana Venture Capital Association, we need you in the space. And, and th Samson, thank you for your convening power. A lot of times people underestimate the the convening powers of people in government. And I feel the finance ministry itself is like one of the most important cogs in the government wheel. It's not surprising that the, when the president announced cabinet, the first ministry he mentions is finance. Because if we take you out, nothing works. And we, we appreciate the minister for allowing you to do this. We also appreciate Dr. Ansu and the team, because there's a very big team that's been working on this. I also want to say a big thank you to Ike and Africa Media, business media team. For, for the work and Mary as well. Mary has been laboring night and day with Ike and Abba and all of them working behind the scenes to make this happen. We are hoping to do something else around this area, this time from a location. We want to go to a university, get the students to get involved because they are the ones who will be thinking of opportunities. So there's a lot more coming up, but a big thank you to all of you. My name is Bernard Avalet. Thank you for being on this platform. We will edit and put some part of this on social media for the rest of the world to watch so the conversation continues have a good afternoon we'll see you next time bye bye thank you thank you bye you don't see any idea you don't see any technical